Hey everybody. Um, my name is Alexis. I'm your Amy. And we're going to be presenting over presenting on the role of social work and psychology in improving communities. Okay, to start, I just want to introduce myself a little bit more. Um, I'm Alexis again. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I attend currently the University of Texas at Austin. I'm a double major in psychology and African and African diaspora studies. So for this presentation, um, although I am a double major, I'm just going to be focusing um, more on the psych psychology aspect of my major, my two majors. And so, yeah, um, the first thing I want to talk about is what psychology is. Um, psychology is the study of an individual's mind and behavior. It evaluates the why. So it asks, why do we behave a certain way? Why do we think a certain way? Or why do we feel a certain emotion? And after asking these whys, what um, psychologists um, and researchers do, they try to understand what could be causing these um, behaviors or these thoughts or these feelings. And they ask things like, could it be to societal pressures? Could it be to our environment um, and the people in our environment? Or could it be related to things like genetics and our biology? And so it's just really interesting to see how many things that you can think about that could influence the way that we behave and think. And so this picture on the right delves more into the different perspectives of modern psychology. So there are seven major perspectives of modern psychology. I'm not gonna name all of them or go through all of them just because that's time consuming, but I do wanna highlight at least three. So. Um, for any of you who are interested in psychology, can get a more broader um, perspective of what you'll be going into. Okay, so behavioral, um, the behavioral perspective, which is this picture of this person with the little engines in their brain. Um, this perspective focuses solely on how others behave, so it doesn't really emphasize internal factors as much as the others, but it's more concerned about things about how people learn and how things are reinforced in their lives. Um, and this particular perspective is used commonly in mental health settings by counselors or therapists to really explain and treat a variety of mental illnesses across the board. Another one that I wanna point out is the humanistic perspective, which is this uh, lady in the right-hand corner who's kind of hugging herself. Um, this perspective is different in that it's a more optimistic approach. So it's different because it focuses less on the dysfunction of an individual and, you know, what's wrong about what they're doing, but it emphasizes an individual's potential and their growth. So some things that um, the humanistic perspective draws in some concepts are the concept of self-confidence, um, our free will, and self-actualization. So self-actualization is pretty much the same as like one's highest potential that they can reach in their life or um, just the ultimate fulfillment in your life. And another one that I wanna point out is cross-cultural psychology. So this is the picture with the map. And I wanted to point this one out because this is really where my interest lies. Um, uh, the cross-cultural psychology really asks like, are psychological concepts really universal? So when we are learning about psychology, a lot of the research, a lot of the studies that we look at are from a, a Western um, European perspective. And so what cross-cultural psychology does, it kind of um, addresses that and asks questions like, well, can we really apply the European perspective across the board for all cultures? And so it observes human behavior across different cultures and figures out how cultural factors impact your behavior. Some examples of this could be like in individualism. So in the United States, in American culture, I think um, individualism is really hardwired in our culture. And um, that's not how it is across the board everywhere. So what cross-cultural psychology does, it kind of compares the two versus a collectivistic culture like African cultures that are less focused on the success of an individual, like individualistic culture would be, um, but are more focused on the success of a group as a whole. 
but yeah, cross-cultural psychology really just ties in social psychology. Um, it looks at how people are influenced by the social environment in which they live, social interactions that they have with other people, um, and just social perceptions in general. Oops. And so, yeah, I just wanted to point out this and show the different perspectives because it shows how multidimensional psychology is. This image itself doesn't really do it justice because within each perspective, there's a lot of other concepts and theories that you can delve into. So one question you may be asking is, why is psychology important? What purpose does psychology serve? Like, what are its goals? And I broke it down into four different things, which is really what is discussed in psychology a lot, is psychology describes, explains, predicts, and changes things. So psychology describes things by describing behaviors of people or animals. And through this description, we're often able to understand better the why, um, like I mentioned before. Um, an example of this could be consumer behavior. So we're trying to describe consumer behavior so we can better understand it, so that we can change it. Um, things like, you can think about things like supply and demand or advertisements. Um, and then explaining. So after describing something, we are better able to explain it um, and bring an awareness to the factors that contribute to any behavior that you're looking at. And so again, bringing in this example from before, you can think about what motivates someone to buy a particular thing. Um, could it have been the advertisement? Could their personality play a role? Um, what about the influence of society? So things like that, explaining really brings in like the questions that you need within psychology. Um, and then predict. So after we describe and explain, we're then able to predict. Um, we're able to identify things better. And this gives us an ability to predict when it will happen. So when a particular behavior will happen, for example, when somebody will spend some something, um, why they spent their money on it, um, <clears throat> and how they might spend their funds. And this all refers back to the example of just consumer behavior. And the last thing is changing. So psychology ultimately, like the main goal is striving to change or influence and control a behavior so that you can make a constructive or a positive change in someone's life. And so, for example, you could think about the um, example of consumer behavior again. Marketers and businesses can predict um, a buyer's behavior, and from their data um, and those predictions, they then can try to alter how they influence or persuade their buyers. So these are just an example of how it can go. But in general, um, in general, psychology um works to improve communities in many ways and so i highlighted some of these ways in which it does so um it works to improve communities by developing and improving educational programs so when we're able to understand um how students learn better we can then change the system to benefit their learning um it works to improve communities by informing public policy by helping to manage and overcome symptoms of distress and psychological illness for people who are seeking therapy or just struggling in general with the mental, uh, the mental health. It expands research, which is the most important really because through this research, we are able to, again, better explain, describe, predict, and then change the outcomes of things. Um, it improves communities by understanding child development better um, and things like performance enhancement for ath athletes um, or people who are in the workforce or so whatever the case may be. Um, obviously, this list is not limited to just that, but it just shows you um, that the sky's really the limit with psychology and it can be applied to pretty much every aspect of life. So why did I choose psychology? What did I love about it? Um, I think number one for me, I'm just a naturally inquisitive person. I put AKA nosy on here. Um, it's not really something that people brag about, but I think that for me, it really inspired me to 
um, and drove me into the psychological field, like wanting to learn more about psychology. Um, if you think about like, if you have siblings or cousins that are toddlers and when they're at that toddler stage, they're always asking that question, like, why, why this, why that? And I think for me, that has always stayed with me the course of my life. Like I've always been um, very curious in that manner where I want to dig deeper and understand things beyond the surface level of what they appear to be. Um, I also chose psychology because it can be applied to anything pretty much like I mentioned before. And I think this is probably the coolest aspect of psychology because it can be found in literally, literally anything, even things that seem trivial. It uh, develops communication skills and insight on people. So for me, I'm not really a charismatic person. I think I'm more introverted. I'm definitely more introverted. But psychology has inspired me to know more and ask more questions when I'm meeting new people, when I'm in different uh, settings, um, and just have those conversations in general. Like I'm always kind of thinking about why someone said what they said, or why they're behaving or acting a certain way. It's just something that I've always been interested in. Um, and then two other reasons is because I really desire to understand mental illness. Um, I think that being educated on the topic of mental illness is really, really important. I think that my generation has really um, been beneficial in kind of alleviating the stigma of mental illness. And so I just want to continue in that process for not only myself, but for my community, especially within the African American community. I feel like if I know more, I'll be able to help more people in my community, friends, family, who I know who are struggling with mental illness. And that's just something I really desire to do. Uh, I also desire to expand research on psychological issues within my community. So again, I wanna be able to expand literature, like studies, research on really uh, racial psychological trauma and issues overall and how the construct of like race um, impacts psychological issues within the African-American community, um, because I think it's important, very, very important. So yeah, with all this being said, if you are going to attend UT, there's some courses that you're gonna need to take uh, within a psychology, psychology degree. Um, I am not a Bachelor of Science major, but I put it on here just because I understand and I didn't want to limit it to just Bachelor of Arts because I understand there's people who are interested in psychology who are also interested in science. And so, yeah, if you are, though, um, like me and will be more on the Bachelor of Arts side, you'll need to take Psych 301, which is an introduction to psychology course. Um, this course can really be taken anywhere outside of UT. So if you want to transfer like I did, if you want to take the course at a community college, you can do that first and get it transferred over to UT. Um, Psy 418 is a class. Uh, it's statistics and research that you'll have to take at UT. Um, yeah, that's all that I'm going to say about that. If you like math, it'll be great, but it really just depends. Um, 21 hours of any psychology courses with 18 hours being upper division and residence at UT. So yeah, the, the BA in psychology is really best for students planning on going into like the workforce after their bachelor's. So examples of that could be law school, or if you wanna do an MBA program or graduate school in psychology or other fields, this could be the best option for you. Um, but just talking more about the workforce and the BA degree. So the workforce could look like social work, like um, Udemy is going to talk about a um, little bit later. You could talk about or you could, if you're interested in doing educational psychology, public affairs, IT, like those are all things that apply the Bachelor of Arts. Um, with the Bachelor of Arts, you also need to have an intermediate level of proficiency in any foreign language at UT. Again, you don't have to take foreign language at UT if you don't want to. You can very much so do that at a community college and get that transferred if it's something that you just kind of want to get out the way. Um, the BA also allows for more elective courses. So you can take 
these elective courses, which I really like this about the BA because you can take these elective courses to kind of uh, boost up your skills for your career goals or just postgraduate study. So you can take courses like business, maybe another foreign language, a writing course, or any type of communication courses, but it's not limited to just that. Um, yeah, I just wanna know if you plan to be a psychology psychologist, if that's something that you desire to do, then the BA probably would be the better, the best degree option for you. So with the bachelors of science, same thing, Psych 301, Psych 418. Um, but then you need 25 hours of natural science and math courses. Um, and this does include calculus, so take note of that. Um, but these are the different, it break, it's broken up into these different categories. So six hours of clinical, social, developmental, or evolutionary psychology, six hours of cognition, language, excuse me, neuroscience, psychology, nine hours of any additional psychology with six of those having to be upper division. So yeah, with the BS, it requires a few hours in the foreign language area. And I think that UT realizes that, you know, you're gonna have a lot of math heavy, science heavy courses. So they needed to cut down in a different area. And so they did that with the foreign language. Um, with the BS, it's really only recommended for students who are going into medical school or into other professional health fields. So this could include things like physical therapy or occupational therapy. Um, if you wanna become a physician's assistant or if you wanna do dentistry or optometry, like whatever, anything in the professional health field, or if you wanna go into med school, um, this is the best option for you. I think it's also important to note too, if you wanna take the BS route, just be sure to assess your background in math. Um, I think that it's important to say though, that like, if you're not good in math, that's okay. Because I think that's what deters people. They're like, oh, I'm not good in math. I'm not gonna take it. I'm not gonna go this route. Um, you still very much so could do BS. Like if you wanna become a doctor, if you wanna go into dentistry, like you still could do the BS degree. You're just gonna have to put in extra work and work harder and really take advantage of your resources, like going to tutoring and getting the help that you need, but it's, it's, it's doable. Um, but yeah, assess your background in math. And if you love science, then this is a go for you because very sciencey. So um, yeah. Um, and lastly, I just wanna talk about my favorite courses in psychology so far. So I am a junior, so I still have a few more courses to take, or more hours. Um, one of the courses that I liked was the psychology of human sexuality. So I took this at ACC before I transferred. I really liked this class because um, it just really explored a lot of different topics. Talked about things like child development, a relationship, love, sexuality, and a lot of other things. Um, there were moments in the class where we had some uncomfortable conversations, but I think that's what really drove the class and inspired you to want to learn more. And I think those uncomfortable conversations were important, very, very important. And I think that, you know, it's a great way to just expose yourself to diverse course curriculum. So if you're interested in anything in, related to human sexuality, definitely take the class. Um, I also like the psychology of African American experience, and I took this at UT. Um, this specific course itself dove into aspects of psychology that aren't really talked about in common psychological literature, which is race, um, and how race impacts psycholo psychology, specifically within the African American community. Um, this course was taught by Dr. Coakley, an amazing professor, um, and I think I really love this class, and it became my favorite course because um it showed me kind of where my interest li lies more and that is in understanding how psychology ties into um the african-american community african-american culture and that's another reason why i'm a double major in african african diaspora studies um but yeah it was just it felt great to be in a class where a lot of my classmates you know looked like me um which is very 
rare to be at UT because it's a predominantly white institution. So it just felt great to have um, that class, to have those conversations, um, those difficult conversations and the good conversations as well. It was just a great space for me. Um, and then right now I'm taking a mindfulness, compassion, and the self course um, as we speak in the summer. Um, and this course is really, really good. It talks about mindfulness. And if you don't know what mindfulness is, I would just recommend that you look it up. It's a really great skill and technique to have. Um, it talks about self-compassion, which is something that I feel like I never really uh, talked about before. So it really is helpful to learn about it. Um, and it talks about compassion for others in this perspective of the Western and Eastern perspective. Um, and last thing I want to note is that the psychology of African American experience and mindfulness course, they're both elective courses. So they're actually not courses that you would take within the psychology department because they're not offered in the psychology department. Um, they're actually offered in the College of Education. So yeah, but good thing about if you're going the Bachelor of Arts route, you'll have the flexibility to take uh, elective courses. So yeah, gonna pass it over to Yuremi here. She's gonna talk about being a student in the School of Social Work. Hello, I'm Yuremi. My um, pronouns are she, her, hers. I also attend UT and I'm majoring in social work. All right. Um, can you change the slide, please? All right. So, um, what social work is is um, it's a field that helps other people um, overcome challenging situations in their lives. So, these situations can include poverty, mental health, addiction, um, those in the foster care system, and many more that just struggle um, with an array of of things such as their personal health as well um, and it is founded on social justice and and equality and there are three types of social work there's direct practice social work clinical social work and macro social work um, direct practice social work is more where you'll work directly with people and communities um, children and families and it's um and it's more feels like child care um, so in this field, you're working more directly with people rather than kind of behind the scenes, um, family working rather than just um, rather than just it being like on the phone or something. Um, and for this, you just need your bachelor's in social work. Um, Clinical social work is more for those who want to go into mental health, so like counseling. Um, but for this, you do need a master's in social work, which requires four years or like requires your bachelor's and you have to go into grad school and get your master's, which is an additional two years. Um, however, at UT, there is a program where you can get your master's in social work, um, I think in like three semesters rather than the whole two years. Um, and then macro social work is more in working in like a government um, position or more like an office space to where you're not working directly with people, but you are more um, working with like government and policies or private institutions to change um, the programs. And that is what I would, what I am mostly interested in doing, um, so not directly working with the children in foster care, but more in the system to where I would be changing their policies um, and giving them better conditions. Okay, um, next one. Uh, why is social work important? Um, social work is a great resource for low-income communities. Um, so many describe social work as a social workers as a voice to the voiceless however that is not the case um they have a voice they've been there um where our job is only helping them project their voice and using our resources so that they can be heard 
Um, and then we also help those with mental illnesses as um, mental illness can be like a taboo in Latinx um, communities. So as a Latinx social worker, um, I would more um, I would be able to relate to them a little bit more and help them get the resources that they need. And although the pay is not always the best, um, it is very a very fulfilling job where many will benefit from your work. Um, so um, it's something that is very important to me as well um, in helping others. All right, um, next one, please. Sorry, it's like frozen. One second. Okay, um, so I chose social work because I've always loved helping others. I know it is a very cliche thing to say, but I've always have enjoyed um, helping others in, um, in whatever way that I can. Um, however, the foster care system has always intrigued me and just learning about their systems and their policies and what they and the living conditions of those who are in the foster care system. Um, I've done research and it shows how they often don't have, um, they live in very tight spots or they aren't always being fed um, how they should be or even in the homes that they do go to, they get abused. And so um, um, what I would like to do is implement policies to give them better living conditions and also set up a pass um, towards upper education. Um, and not only that, but just help them succeed in life. Um, if they don't choose to continue their education, there's many other ways to be successful in life. And my job would be um, setting up a pathway uh, instead of them going, um, to what they call the foster care system, the prison pipeline, to where um, a lot of them do end up in prison, unfortunately. And that is only because of the policies implemented right now that aren't allowing them or giving them the resources that they need to be successful. And also, I believe that my people um, skills will help me better connect with these communities and better understand how I can help them. So um, once you get into the social work major at UT, you do have to complete your basic social work courses before you can reapply to, under to take the major sequence classes, at, as they call it. So um, for the first two years or so, you would be taking Social Work 310, which is Intro to Social Work and Social Welfare. Um, that class is more just of an introduction um, to to what social workers do, to kind of um, like their like their ethics, so what they can do and what they can't do, like their boundaries that are set um, as a social worker. It also talks about the different um, minorities in this country and what struggles they face. Um, there's also Social Work 312, which is a generalist social work practice, knowledge, values, and skills. There's social work research methods, social work stats, and foundations of social justice. And once you have taken these, you can apply to take the major sequence classes. And, and um, so you would need 45 hours of coursework, a minimum UT Austin GPA of a 2.0, a minimum 2.5 GPA in social work courses, and emotional and professional readiness to work with clients, a personal statement, and a reference from your social work 312 instructor. And, but it's pretty, um, it's pretty common for those who, for those who apply to the major sequence sequence classes to get in. They just want to make sure that you are ready to take the upper sequence classes and which um, require working um, with more students once you get um, or more clients once you get into the upper um, 
division classes. So they do want to make sure that that is really what you want to do before you get um, any further into your degree plan. So you have time to switch your major if you need to. Um, all right, and then I've only taken two social work courses, which is um, Intro to Social Work and Social Welfare and Social Work Stats. But my Social Work Stats class wasn't um, like related to social work that much. It was mostly just um, like new, knowing how to input data into this computer program and finding out the um, information that you need. So I really did enjoy my intro to social work class because it showed me, um, it kind of gave me a clear path on what I want to do. Um, so it just explores all of the systems of inequality in America and what we can do as social workers to help. So since the School of Social Work is a very small school, we don't have a lot of students. So that means our classes are pretty small, which allows for a greater in-depth discussion on these um, systems um, and then we also have to do 30 at least 30 hours of volunteering at a non-profit non agency so um, I volunteered at this organization called Halo which is um, an after-school sports program for low-income students so what I would do is I would just go and set up um, all of the activities and um, play with the kids and I would also um, we had a homework time so what I would do is I would play I would play <laughs> I would help the students with their homework if they needed to and um, also give them snacks um, but this really this really showed me my strengths and weaknesses so I um, I thought this agency would be the right place for me because I've always been um a very athletic person and i've always loved playing sports so i thought it would be a great chance for me to um play with those um students but i realized that they were uh, um i'm not very good with playing or handling a lot of kids at a time and so which further led me to realize that maybe working um um like face to face with with kids wasn't the best choice for me, um, which led me to kind of choose more of like the macro social work side of social work. And um, so yeah, yeah, I think it's a really, there's so many things you can do within the agencies. They give you a list, um, like an online database list where you can see all of the different agencies and kind of filter what, what your interests are so you can do um if you want to tutor kids if you want to work with homelessness if you want to work with those in the lgbtq community um there's really such a plethora of things you can do um or you can volunteer at and they're all over austin so it's near um ut so if you don't have transportation you can easily take a metro there and with your student ID, the metro is free. All you need to do is swipe. So they're very, they're really accessible when it comes to um, transportation. Okay, cool. So, yeah, with all of that being said, we just want to leave you guys with some, you all with some advice. Um, the one thing that I would say is to show up for yourself and this can um, be done in many different ways. So for example, if you're struggling with a course, if you're struggling with trying to understand a concept, show up for yourself and attend office hours or go to tutoring or attend a study group. Um, use these tools to help you, you know, understand. Or if you know, you want to give your input on topic in class. So I understand as an introverted person and in general, just going to a university, especially in classes that are um, 100 plus, it can be very intimidating to speak up, but it's important to do so because, you know, you may have an input that someone else in the back of the room is thinking as well, or you may have a question someone else is thinking as well. Um, but it's just important to, always try to step out your comfort zone because that's where you grow and you you learn the most so yeah show up for yourself by 
using your voice. Or if you want to find community, show up for yourself through networking, attending student organization meetings, attending on-campus events. And when you get to UT, if that is where you're going, but this applies to all colleges, um, usually the first week of school is the week in which you can really dive into going to all these events. Like they have a welcome week for all students and they have tabling where Student orgs are all outside, they're tabling, they're trying to recruit. So it's a great opportunity to take advantage of to really try to find the community at your college. And then also show for yourself when you're feeling down. It's gonna happen. You're gonna get frustrated. You're gonna feel maybe disappointed in yourself. Um, it can just show up in many different ways. But when you do notice those feelings coming along, show up for yourself. Um, hold yourself accountable by reaching out to a friend or going to the CMHC, which stands for the Counseling and Mental Health Center. This is specifically at UT, but they have uh, mental health facilities at all colleges. Colleges is colleges. <laughs> so you can practice. Um, you can do that. You can attend those um, and they're really beneficial. Um, yeah, they're beneficial. And you can also practice some self-care exercises if you don't feel like going to talking to someone. You could journal, you could um, exercise, you know, just do things that you know are gonna make you feel better, feel good. Yeah, um, I agree with Alexis. Um, definitely show up for yourself, speak up. Um, what you can do is just simply ask a professor for help after class or like she said, go to office hours. Um, get, get, um, it's easier for your professor to get to know you, especially when the classes are so big. Um, also, I recommend just, even if you just want to like further conversate on what they were talking about during class, it is also very helpful. Um, yeah, um, so with, when the classes are so big, it's just easier to sit in the front. That's what I recommend. That's what I did. Um, cause the classes receive so much smaller when you're in the front and, um, and it just, and it also is, you're more visible to your professor. So he'll recognize, or he or she will recognize your face. Um, also it is very common especially as a first generation student to feel down to just be hard on yourself it's, there's also this thing called imposter syndrome where you feel like you don't belong at um at your institution but just know that it is very um common and it happens to all of us and it's okay but it's also very important to get help um or just um do some self-care and then um, also participating in research is really, really important. It just, um, it is another way to step out of your comfort zone. It helps you build your resume, helps you get to know people, and, um, and it also just um, broaden, broad, broadens, sorry, your, um, just like your perspective, perspective on life. Just, it just depends what you're doing research on. Um, I became a research assistant, literally, like the week before school even started <laughs> because um i'm part of i'm part of a, the gateway scholars which is a um is um I'm sorry this like organization for first generation students at ut and so what they did they had like a welcome a welcome to ut kind of gathering and so when i went i was able to talk to one of the professors that are part of the organization and I was explaining to him how I like how I was interested in doing research and um further into my um my school experience um and luckily his wife um it was also doing research and so he he um I'm sorry he he introduced me to his wife and I later became a research assistant for her. And so I've learned so much since then because our research was for, um, for youth who are in detention centers and especially um, um, youth of color. 
So it just helps you better understand what they've gone through and what led them to get there and what systems, um, what the policies in these systems that were placed for them to um, end up there to where it wasn't really um, so much like their fault, but also just everyone that has pushed them out and just based on their color, um, treated them differently. So yeah, um, research has been really um, helpful for me in many ways and I definitely, it's definitely something that I don't regret doing. Um, lastly, I just want to say study abroad if you get the chance um, or make the chance. Um, I think it's, it's really an enriching learning opportunity to study abroad that you won't get outside of college. I mean, you're able to go somewhere, you're able to live with um, a family of a different culture, um, in a different environment, and learn, you know, what you want to learn, study your major, study, you know, things that you're interested in. And that's something that you is unique to college that you'll probably only be able to experience specifically in college. And I understand that um, funding is a major barrier. Um, it seems like a barrier for me. I'm a junior, still haven't studied abroad, was going to study abroad, but some things happened, but I'm still determined to study abroad. Um, yeah, I think with the funding issue, like there's so many resources out there. You just really have to do the work and dig to find them and apply yourself, but it's, it's possible with effort, with effort. So yeah, I just, I really recommend studying abroad because it's a once in a lifetime thing. Um, so yeah, that is it for our presentation today. Um, we really enjoy our majors. So if you guys have any questions, if you want any advice, um, if it's just about going to UT in general, you know, we're here. You can email us um, at any time. And yeah, we'll, we'll definitely reach back out to you. But thank you guys for watching this recorded video of our presentation if you've made it to the end we really appreciate it and we wish you luck on your journey um with your first year in college